I can see that we have our next two guests here. Um, I believe uh, this is Dr. Santos. Please uh, correct me if I've mispronounced your name and Dr. Cohn. And I don't know uh, who would go first, but uh, welcome. And uh, we've just had an hour with Brian going over uh, two bills and we'd love to hear, uh, hear from you. Eugene, you wanna do first? I cede Hi. my time to the gentleman from Dartmouth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, so I just wanted to come and say, and um, uh, I actually was uh, listening earlier. I was on uh, YouTube listening to the discussion. Uh, yeah, these are all the, the questions, you know, I, I just want to refer to one about, you know, where, where, where are the technology experts? Do they have the questions yet? And I'm going to be blunt. Uh, we don't have quite the questions. We don't have quite the answers, but there's a lot of focus areas that, you know, really has to be addressed. So like the questions of, hey, you know, what is this AI actually doing? You know, those of you who did get a chance to watch Coded Bias, you know, or any of the other shows just comes up with, uh, why do they make this decision? So I'm gonna give you, you know, sort of the point of view that I think is uh, important, at least to me as an AI creator, is that if I'm gonna be putting out a technology, which is AI, what is the transparency has to be behind it? You know, what are the intentions of that AI tool. You know, one of the, one of the biggest things that uh, people don't talk about as much when they put out a particular AI system, what is the goals? You know, uh, in the end, it's a computer algorithm. Uh, you could say that it is a mathematical function that the computer algorithm is trying to compute and com trying to optimize on. So, you know, a, a simple example is that you know, I have, I have some sort of mathematical function that ends up in the end when it has to do like, let's just go ahead and talk about facial recognition. When it has to classify something, it's trying to optimize this function. As a creator, when I dig into those functions, let's just even talk about deep learning. Oh my gosh, what the heck is this function? I, I can't even understand it. And then, you know, then our job as a creator nowadays is can I decompose it in some way? Can I make it in some way so that we humans then can understand it itself. So, you know, for me, things uh, having served on the task force, uh, one of the, 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 the biggest benefits that I think that if it's setting up commission would be is that, hey, we have this diversity of viewpoints from other members too, that are not necessarily creators, they would be potentially the consumers, the people who would help also evaluate impact uh, across, you know, society and all helping me as a creator. So I'll, I'll just focus back on me as a creator, focus on where I should go. What information should I provide? So, you know, like Rep Representative China had said, you know, for this, uh, uh, the, the second bill that was just presented, these are the elements that, you know, you start off with those questions and then you could dig in deeper on that. Um, so that's, that's my point of view. Um, one term I use a lot is, and it's my own work, is intentions. You know, if I know the computational intentions, if I know the AI intentions, that at least gives us a context for explaining to people what this AI algorithm is doing. So let me stop there and I'll pass that to John now. Great, thank you. Great, I, I really appreciate that, Gene. Um, so just by way of introduction, um, I'm John Cohn. I'm, the, I'm an IBM fellow at the MIT IBM uh, AI lab. Uh, this is, uh, I've been at IBM for unbelievably uh, 40 years. Um, I see some former IBM colleagues here. Um, <laughs> Mike. Um, but I uh, uh, had a, a very interest, uh, my career has mostly been in the creation of computers and chips. Uh, and I'm sort of a newcomer, a digital newcomer to uh, running this AI lab. Um, I, uh, and the other background that I have is I'm a strong STEM advocate and have worked for many years in, in promoting science, love of science and technology in the state and have served on the uh, Vermont, it was the Department of Education then, uh, Science Advisory Council uh, for many years in the uh, early 2000s. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I prepared a few comments mostly around uh, Representative Gina's bills. And I just want to say beforehand how much I appreciate uh, everyone uh, 
their their deep consideration of this topic and of those bills. Um, uh, just our experience on the AI task force was very, very interesting. Uh, you know, at the time, that task force was the first in the nation, and we really, you know, looked at it through the lens of how do we maximize the benefits. This is an amazing technology and is already, you know, providing a lot of value. But I came away with a much fuller understanding of how we have to minimize the, the negative impacts. And I was very struck, uh, we, in the, in the course of the year, we were very struck by, uh, I think, not just me, uh, about how much concern there was. And, and if anything, I became much more sensitized to that. And, uh, but I also realized that a lot of the, a lot of the sensitivity and, and concern was well-founded, but a lot of it was also based on, you know, a lack of understanding and fear. But I came, I came away, you know, really, uh, very, uh, excited about the recommendations that we had in the task force. And, and that's why I'm very excited about, um, I'm very supportive of, of, of um, H410, the idea of, of trying to take that, that piece of work. It would, like I said, it, you know, it, it, I think Vermont has at its advantage the brave little state that we're small enough to actually get things done. And we, we have kind of a lead in that to sort of lead by example. And I really am happy of that. Uh, what I'd like to say is there are a couple of specific things in, in H410 uh, coming from the AI task force that I really, really think are important. Um, one thing that, you know, kind of building off of what Gene said is that the need for standards and guidelines on ethical use of AI. Uh, right now, it's kind of a a wild, wild west. There, I mean, the problem with things like ethical standards, it's there are some things that that are absolute in ethics, and some things that are kind of relative. And we really need to to have some guidelines as a, you know as a yardstick. And uh, the U.S. has has been a bit behind, like the EU and Canada, in in, in coming up with a set of ethical standards. But um, so in 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 our in our guidelines, we adapted and adopted uh, with with Representative Gina's uh, leadership, um, the EU guidelines. And I think we need to, uh, we really need to have a, an evolving but a standard set that we can kind of use as a yardstick. So I think having standards is important, but standards without some sort of oversight wouldn't really get us anywhere. So one of the main um, uh, recommendations of the task force and one of the main recommendations of H410 is the need for an ongoing oversight uh, committee to actually, you know, do the business of, of monitoring and adjusting. I think it's so key that we do this on an ongoing basis because in my 40 years in technology, I've never seen anything grow this fast. And this is not hype. We're already, you know, AI is, you know, in everybody's cell phone, it's, it's everywhere. And anything that tries to statically capture, you know, what it should and shouldn't do, what it can and can't do, um, is going to be out of date the moment you do it. So I think it's absolutely essential that the state of Vermont has some sort of an oversight group. And that's why I really support the commission, the ongoing commission, and uh, we'll support that in any way I can. Um, my personal, uh, in terms of the other recommendations that are in, in H410 and, and the AI task force, uh, the, the three things that really struck out to me beyond having ethical guidelines and a, and a body to, uh, to observe them, monitor them, make recommendations and adapt as the, as the technology adapts as the first is education. Um, I, uh, since I look like a crazy mad scientist, I play that on TV. I uh, very, very much believe that we have an, uh, an opportunity and, and kind of an obligation to, to, to educate the public on what AI can do, you know, the potential, because I think it's huge, what it should do, what it can't do, what it shouldn't do. And uh, I personally believe that the best vector, you know, I was, as I mentioned before, I was very struck by the lack of nuance in the conversations that we had with, with educated people about what AI might do. Um, I believe that a, a major vector in educating the public is through students. And uh, uh, several of us on the committee, noticeably uh, Professor Donna Riso, who's a professor at UVM, I'm also a, a professor at UVM, I should have said that, um, uh, made, we, we were thinking, well, we really need to try to, you know, get exposure to uh, AI technology, AI ethics, AI privacy, these kind of things. You know, you can start having these kind of conversations as early as middle school, maybe even elementary school, 
we went out to look around and found out that not only is AI not being taught in any consistent way or not in any way really at all, but computer science in general or technology is very, very spotty in the States. So we, we really support, we, we've been, uh, a small group of us have been actually trying to act on that. We've actually got an NSF grant in on something called Computer Science for All uh, that we're um, reapplying for. Uh, we, we have several other programmatic ways, including things like FIRST Robotics, which I work in to, to, to try to introduce students to the basics of computer science and thereby introduce them to AI and then able to have not only technology discussions and career discussions, but you can have ethics discussions. So I think that trying to, to, to tell people about the promise, but also the danger of unintended consequences is a very, very important thing that the state could do. And I believe very much, again, this is where our brave little state, a small state where we can actually make things happen. Um, so education is my main goal in this because I think an educated population makes the best decisions, whether they're building AI or using it. Uh, the next one would be around incentives an incentive structure. I believe that once we've got a good handle on what ethical AI is, we want to figure out how do we maximize the benefit to the state. And that also includes economic benefit. You know, I think that uh, the uh, AI jobs, if we, and I'll talk about future of work in a second, but you know, AI is changing all sorts of, of, of um, types of work and it builds great opportunities. And if we could attract more, what we call good, clean, ethical AI jobs to the state, um, they're low resource, they're environmentally clean, and it's an intellectual place. And, you know, as a longtime hippie, you know, Prius driving, Birkenstock wearing hippie from Vermont, you, you want people like that moving here. This is a great place to do that kind of work. So uh, I believe that we can come up with incentives that help high tech companies in general and specifically AI companies. And they don't necessarily have to be, you know, buckets of money. They can be access to accelerated computing, et cetera, through the University of Vermont. I think this is something that Bill, you know, that the, the, the uh, task force came up with and that I think we should look for creative ways that the state can afford to help incent those kind of jobs. Uh, finally, I mentioned the future of work briefly. Uh, my group at MIT is doing a lot of uh, using AI to look at the impact of AI on the future workforce. And we have to really think about that because there's a lot of worry that things like AI or robotics are going to uh, displace, uh, you know, human labor. And, and, and create, uh, and, and some of that is true and some of it is not true, but we're actually trying to look at it analytically. And one thing that we notice is that, you know, on the low end of AI, I mean, the low end of, of uh, kind of from wages, um, those, those technologies, you know, human labor, you know, manual labor, et cetera, are not that susceptible to AI specifically. Um, on the high end, there's certainly gonna be lots of high end jobs like mine that'll be formed and there's you know great growth opportunity. The big concern is that in the middle wage jobs, which is the bulk of them, you know, service jobs, et cetera, there's going to be job displacement, job migration. And I believe that we need to start factoring that into our career mentoring of students, uh, you know, to figure out how they choose careers, how they tool up for those careers once things like service industries, you know, restaurant jobs, uh, retail, et cetera, are getting highly automated. How do, do students prepare for that? And for you know, uh, people of a certain age, like me, you know, if they have to retool in mid-career, like I became an AI person in my 60s, you know, uh, how, do you, how do you adjust, how do we retrain people? So I think all of these things, I think, would, uh, in H410, would, acting on the, the recommendations would be good. Um, I'd like to, if, if I have, I would really like to talk about H263. Uh, uh, Is it okay, can I keep talking for a few minutes? Well, you know what, we have um, our chairman is going to be rejoining us in just a moment, and I know that he it would be helpful for him to hear your testimony on the bill. I see that we have a few committee members who have questions. Would it be okay? Sure. If and we, then, okay, okay. If, if I can, I would like to talk about 263, but of sure. Of course, absolutely. Sure. Uh, Representative Chase. Thank you. Um, I have the, the initial formation of a thought, and I would uh, appreciate uh, both of your insight on it. Um, something you, you said was a um, the ethical use of uh, AI, and I want to highlight the difference between that and the use of ethical AI, um, like the idea of developing a, um, 
a quote unquote evil AI as a test bed to create uh, like a war game sort of scenario where we could find vulnerabilities and so forth um, and how that might be I, I'm, I'm not sure whether that would be um, <laughs> good or bad um, and I would appreciate both of your insight into how that could fit into this discussion whether that's something that we want to um, interesting Gene what do you think okay. I, I got a thought but okay yeah uh, my reaction to that is that this is something that has to be addressed here, you know, whether it's the commission or whether it's, you know, the, the second bill on, you know, uh, you know, where the hour is going. The, the whole point of that is that there's a lot of positives, you know, you're developing an AI to search for vulnerabilities. Uh, and if it's developed uh, under, you know, the, the right guidelines in terms of, you know, hey, are there going to be any side effects that, you know, that uh, this AI might cause. Uh, what are understanding, what's the dangers of accidentally releasing this AI if you don't want it to be, I mean, it, it's a classic. It's like, you know, one of the historical examples is if everybody remember the, uh, read about or heard about the Morrison worm, I think I got that John was, it was Morrison, right? I'm sorry. So this was one of the earliest computer worms that I remember that at the, at the time I was a graduate student back in the eighties had gotten released and actually basically took down our early internet around here. And, you know, a lot was learned from that. Uh, I can't say, you know, even to this day, whether, you know, it was at, uh, deliberately malicious or it was an academic exercise, but it was important. I mean, these things that, as you said, if you use in a wargaming situation, we've now defined and scoped out the problem. But it, I think it's a very good distinction that you're putting us is that, you know, ethical AI or ethical use of AI. And each of these, this is where the commission needs to come in and help, uh, you know, folks make decisions on that and think about where it goes. Um, John, I, I I really like the idea. Um, Representative Chase came up, or are you Representative Chase? Yes. Or, oh, good. Everybody else has rep. Um, I, I think that this whole idea um, of using AI to explore AI is actually catching. Have you heard of uh, what, what are called uh, generalized adversarial networks? Uh, this is a GAN. So Gene, what I'm, uh, you know, uh, at MIT, we have a, a project with MIT where we're using adversarial network. Uh, that's a terrible name for it, but it's basically using AI to explore AI. And so uh, the example that that Gene gives on, on the worm is that we actually have a malware AI that tries to formulate new, ex, you know, look for exposures and then another AI that tries to block them. And it's an interesting technology because that's what's happening in the malware world right now is that, you know, the bad guys have AI and you just have to have better AI. And it is this kind of, you know, unfortunately it's, you know, it accelerates, but, but AI is a great tool for exploring those kind of vulnerabilities. I really like the idea of exploring, you know, kind of ethical vulnerabilities. And I think it would be interesting. Um, you know, one one thing that uh, as a, a UVM faculty and Gene, I don't know, you probably the same with Dartmouth that we would love to be able to work, you know, that's a real meaty problem. And uh, I think that would be very interesting to see if we could seed some research in that. Cause I think that would be, I'm sure that somebody somewhere is doing ethical adversarial uh, uh, exploration, but I think that's a really interesting idea. Okay, great. Representative Sims. Yeah, thank you so much for this testimony. Really interesting. I, I particularly appreciated the, um, you know, calling out the importance of a permanent task force to provide this oversight. You know, I, th I think we all are experiencing how technology is innovating more and more rapidly. And um, I appreciate you calling attention to the fact that, you know, the minute we maybe set rules and guidelines in place, they will be obsolete the next week. And that this is really continuous um, monitoring and evaluation that's so important. Um, you know, I, I think we, we heard some really helpful kind of context and framing from Representative China about some examples of what AI or algorithmic um, decision-making looks like right now. I'd be curious whether either of you 
um, could expound on that a little bit more. Are there stories that you find particularly, you know, resonant for sort of helping us who are less familiar with this world understand the opportunities and challenges that this kind of technology creates? And, you know, what, what are the things that keep you up at night or the, you know, things that you're most concerned about um, just to kind of paint, paint the story and the picture of what this looks like for those of us who are not deep in the weeds um, but certainly experiencing the impact of this in our daily lives, but may not even realize it. I guess I can go first, John. Sure. All right. So, you know, I work, you know, when we looked at the categories for the second bill, you know, in terms of like support automated decision systems, or I actually can't remember the exact terms, but there, that's one of the areas that I work in. And so I'll say two things. I'm going to go ahead and start off with sort of the, the concerns. The one thing that keeps me up at night is that, you know, if we're creating AI that's supporting, right, uh, and it's coming and says that, hey, uh, if, if whether it's like uh, helping recognize that it looks like there's a bad situation here, or it's recognizing that there's an opportunity here, or this is how you should, you know, make your decision. I mean, you know, the, 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 the concern there is that what's the basis of it again? You know, like I said before, is that, you know, where's, where's this answer coming from? Why is it selecting this answer when there's other alternative answers? And, you know, the concern is that if I don't give enough context, you know, I am influenced, or I should say I am, my AI is influencing somebody to make a decision. And, you know, it could be compounding bias on top of bias. Uh, can, am I reporting enough or the AI? I'm sorry, I keep saying I and the AI. So uh, is the AI... Uh, uh, have a blind spot itself? Uh, is the AI making assumptions in uh, choosing that decision for you? So that's very concerning that, it, so, so what does it take? Uh, you know, AI needs to work with the human being and you know, we, we already have, it's hard enough that you know, when I have to talk to other people, I'm sorry, I'm sounding very geeky like that. When I have to talk to other people, it says, you know, are, am I understanding them? Am I making the right decision? And of course, you know, that's, that's a classic challenge of humanity but then now throw in the AI. Now on the positive side though, is that, you know, with the AI it's just, there are all these opportunities. You know, we are overwhelmed, complex systems, complex world, complex data, and the AI gives us a chance to help us better organize it. And so, you know, the, the, that's the general things that, you know, keep me up at night, both positively and negatively, you know, both excitement as well as concern on that. Um, yeah, I mean, John, I'll, I'll hand it to you now. I'm not programmed to respond to this question. No, I'm fuzzy. Um, uh, I think you, that's really good, Gene. I think that's where I was going to go too. I guess, uh, you know, the sort of human uh, computer or human AI interaction is, you know, what really keeps, I mean, there are many existential kind of things when you think out in time, but I think, uh, uh, you know, clearly the ethical decisions, I, I'm, I tend to be a technical optimist and believe we can solve those. I, I think the thing that practically concerns me, uh, two things that practically concern me the most. One is that in our rush to do things, you know, we'll miss unintended consequences. You know, if you looked at uh, like um, the social dilemma, did you see, anybody see that movie? Yeah, that while a very good intention and in one thing, or you know, a, a understandable intention can lead to an unintended consequence. And I think the general problem there is that we're relegating, you know, I, I worry that we might skip a step when we relegate decision-making, absolute decision-making and authority to an AI prematurely. I think that my experience, uh, I have a long experience in automation in, in other domains. And there's, there's kind of a, a growth curve where you you build up mutual trust between you and the AI. And it, it is actually two way in sort of a weird way that the AI has to trust you or has to be able to understand the, the data that you're giving it. And that I think that we when whenever we skip a step uh, and, and start to allow uh, an AI to make decisions on our behalf, whether it's uh, explicitly or tacitly, you know, where we're going to, you know, based on an AI decide that we're going to arrest someone or not give them a loan. I think we really have to be, we have to be slow and cautious on one sense to make sure that there's always a human in the loop, that there's always, you know, uh, some expertise that would 
question the AI, I think, in a, in a, and would be able to ask through the explainability, et cetera, that Gene mentioned, you know, why is this decision being made? And ultimately from a, from a, a accountability that the human would make the decision based on the guidance and would be accountable to the results. The moment we start to take that shortcut and let the AI start deciding. Now, clearly there are times in, in our lives where we have to do that. You think about, well, think about flight for a moment. Let's, let's just talk broadly, not so much about AI only, but automation. Air flight is so much more uh, safe. It's, it's, it's like two orders of magnitude, I believe, safer now than it was a few decades ago because of automation but it had to happen slowly you know you had to build this confidence in the ai you had to build the confidence between the pilot and the ai and as i understand it now you know uh, a transatlantic flight takes you know there's only a legal 45 second interval where the pilot actually has to be driving you know where the ai has to shut off that's pretty amazing but that we came to that slowly we're starting to go through the same thing in, in automatic driving. And there's sometimes you do have to relegate a decision to AI because a human can't react that fast. But I think we have to do this in gradual ways, whether it's in you know making loans, making arrests, uh, uh, making parole. You know, we have to proceed uh, as in a sort of human AI partnership until there's enough mutual confidence that we can make the decision. So I worry that we take shortcuts there. Um, my other worry is actually a little bit on the opposite side as somebody who does AI for a living in corporate, um, that I worry that an unnuanced understanding of what AI can and can't do and should and shouldn't do would lead to um, good intentioned uh, regulation that would actually prevent the good that could happen. So I think that we, you know, kind of when I think about the, um, the second bill, I think that having, I, I, I'm a big believer in oversight and regulation, but I think it has to be very precise. I worry that in, in kind of a uh, overreaction that we would say, you know, no, we can't use any kind of this technology and that we, we block ourselves out from, uh, from um, the potential good and exploration. So I think we have to be very careful and precise about the regulations that we provide because otherwise I think we'll, we won't really be able to see the, the true benefit. So that's kind of a more of a, a business concern. The first one is kind of a life and limb and, and humanity concern. The other is from a, a business, we have to make a balance that we don't hobble innovation so much that we, we don't get the benefit. And that keeps me so up in a sure. different kind of way. Yeah. Right. Framing this balance, this tension, you know, it, it, it can be the best and the worst of ourselves. And that's our job to sort of shepherd and steward yeah. that really carefully so mm -hmm. that my father-in-law can drive more safely at night because he's supported by self-driving. But, you know, that we're not baking in the bias that we all know that we have, especially within a field that's predominantly dominated by white males, you know, and, and our data sets, um, you know, so that uh, folks have more opportunity to jobs, not less, because of um, you know we can we can mitigate um, for the bias, um, so that depending on your name, you aren't <laughs> excluded from from job applications. So so thanks for framing again that this is an incredible opportunity, um, but uh, we have to proceed really carefully um, so that we're not uh, exponentially um, amplifying the, the worst tendencies <laughs> within all of us. Thanks. Hey, uh, we are, we are, we have our chair back. Welcome back, Mr. Chair. I know you've been on a fast ride. Uh, I think uh, Lucy, uh, Representative Rogers had a question. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you for your presentations. And as a, as for this being relatively new to me, I think one of the challenges is just trying to pick out, you know, everything seems important and just trying to pick out what's one direction to go in first. Um, so I, I had a thought that I've been kind of formulating since our earlier conversation this morning and just wanted your your take on it, which is um, something something had come up earlier about accountability. And it really just started me thinking, you know, who is legally responsible when things go wrong with AI, whether it's, you know, whether it's something where a human ultimately has decision making or something where the technology is making the decision. Um, and I guess just wondering if it seemed like that could be a helpful place to start, because I guess the, the fear I have is that we get into a situation where nobody 
no human is taking responsibility for what's happening. Um, and I shared, I'll say one more thing and then I want to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I shared earlier a story about a friend of mine who, who had a medical school interview that was conducted between her and a computer. And I know there's current examples of court cases with institutes of higher education where the institute is being held responsible for bias in its admissions. And so it just made me think, you know, in this case, if, this isn't the case, but in a more extreme example, if the computer was actually making the decisions about who was admitted to this medical school, would the medical school be responsible if there were instances of bias with the maker of the software? And so I guess I'm just curious if this is, if this seems like it's on the mark or off the mark as far as a direction to be heading in when we think about what we can do legally. And do you have a perspective on who should be the one responsible? to make sure this all works the way it should. Yeah, I, I guess I'll start off with the caveat. I'm not a legal expert, so, but having said that though, I mean, these are, I, I think what you're saying is very much on the mark. Um, one of the things that uh, on the task force we studied and I, I was fortunate enough to, to help lead this part was for example, AI and medicine. So in this case is that, you know, at this point, you know, there's a, a number of AI-driven tools and actually AI decision-making tools uh, used in medicine, such as you know uh, diagnosing retinopathy, you know, which is you know uh, uh, was it uh, a decay of the eye nerves, uh, a, a lot of systems, for example, even predicting that you know what is your trend and your blood glucose levels, uh, and each of these though, like let, let let's take one where you know it's trying to predict whether your tumor is cancerous or not. Well. AI is not going to be perfect. Uh, there's going to be cases where it's going to have a false negative or a false positive. And wh who, who's responsible for that? Now, the, 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 this is important to address, but the one thing that gives me, uh, how should I say, um, some more comfort, maybe that's the wrong word, but you know, s some more sense that it's potentially addressable is that, well, we already have other uh, frameworks in place, which is the FDA, because the FDA has to approve these things. And so, I think it's going to be very important in terms of what are the functioning uh, frameworks that are out there, FDA, uh, FAA, all those things that, all right, see how much they can expand and how much they can actually cover. Now, when you get to the question like, you know, the, the bias at admissions, like, you know, your, your friend having just being interrogated by an AI and the AI making a decision, can that fall anywhere? That's going to be, you know, I, I think an important thing that the commission helps address or any sort of commission like this tries to help address in going forward. Um, I, I think that this is one of the first things that, you know, we go forward on, but I, but as also like, you know, uh, John was also say earlier, like from our original task force, you know, starting with the ethics and at least getting a bounds on that first, then gives us a shot of finding the right path. Yeah, I think this is very good, Gene. Um, I think a couple of things, and I think this reads on H263, is that I think we need to develop standards and those standards have to be evolving. And I do not think that there will ever be a, an, a sweeping you know, a sweeping statement that you could say you should never do X. I think that the kind of regulation and decision making needs to be handled on, if not a case by case basis, there's, there's, there can be some sort of um, uh, a regulatory framework. So for example, when I, I think we can make a, a clean distinction between when a decision has to be made, has to be relegated to a machine, and, and I would say that those are pretty clear. Those are things where a human is not able to, to make the decision fast enough. You know, what I would say for like autonomous driving, uh, autonomous trucks, autonomous trains, which there are now autonomous airplanes, that sometimes you have to relegate a decision to the computer because a human can't be consulted and a human might not be able to respond quickly enough. But I think for the most part, most decisions uh, that are not, uh, you know, life limb time critical, I think you can make it always the case. And I think you have to think about these in a case by case basis that a human needs to take um, 
the, the final decision, whether it's a metal, medical diagnose, whether it's a, a criminal, you know, a, an arrest warrant or a, a you know, a, a, a jail commutation or anything like that, that I think that AI should be working in partnership with humans. And because it is transparent, it has to be transparent, it has to tell you what data it's using, what uh, what conclusion it's drawing, what data it's storing, uh, because it's got to be explainable. So it, it, if, if it makes a decision, it can defend the decision and sort of say, here's the logical basis for that. And because we would have it tested for bias and whatever appropriate context that means, and we can talk about that technically, that the human would be in position, whether it's a doctor, a lawyer, a, um, a hiring manager would be ultimately uh, would know that she or he was responsible for the decision and that way would not lean back and 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 just take you know because if they knew that the the ethical implications and that the, the but perhaps the you know the damage damages uh, implications would be on them they will lean in and pay attention and ask the right questions and ask the ai to explain more so i think that there are there are guidelines. I don't think that there are sweeping guidelines, but I think that we should make sure that uh, that we understand when a computer should be able to make a decision on its own, and that should be very limited cases where there are you know life and limb are necessary for that, and everything else. I I believe at least for the foreseeable future would have a human that would have to sign in for accountability, and then I think. Uh, but I, I, I kind of go back to the idea of having a standards body with narrow targeted rules is the only way to do this because trying to figure this out post hoc is very, very difficult, right? You know, you're just, you end up with finger pointing. But I actually see that there is a kind of a bright line where most decisions don't need to be made so quickly that a human can't be uh, uh, assigned responsibility up front. Excellent. Uh, okay. Um, I, I have a question uh, about uh, limiting, just in terms of policymakers. So for both of you, what is the what is the number one way we could um, we can limit or or manage AI? And I'm not asking what is the best way. I'm asking what is the what is the the most uh, impactful way to limit or control uh, well AI. even if, if i may uh represent policy makers uh, yeah if i may uh even that language is sometimes you know i think we want to we do want to limit in the appropriate but we also want to enable so i, I worry a little bit sometimes that we we already are putting ai in the hot seat you know i think what we I hope, I hope it's okay for me to, to say that. Um, I believe that what's in H263 about actually doing an inventory and understanding all the places where we have uh, software that's potentially um, uh, making helping us with decisions or in some cases making decisions for us. I think that the first thing I would say is important is having uh, a crisp understanding of what technology is in use and what technology might be put into use. I think understanding all the all the points where this might happen would be the first thing I would do. And I like that in H263. Okay. And then I Good. and then I think a set of of uh, you know going starting with those test cases, going through and trying to come up with a rubric for uh, you know accountability and and what uh, what oversight was necessary in each of those, which also I think is in H263, I think is, an, is would be the second case. So I think those are two of the right first moves. Great, excellent, thank you. Uh, Mike, and then, uh, and then uh, I see Representative China has his hand up as well. Hey, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Cohen and Dr. Uh, Santos and, and Brian for your presentations is very, very far reaching. And uh, as I listen to this, uh, it's such a huge apple that we're trying to take a bite out of. Mm. Um, there are, uh, I guess, four areas that I've been thinking about in terms of, that I guess are jurisdictional. And one is state versus federal. Um, we're a small state and anything we do uh, is going to have limited um, reaches 
in terms of developing standards or anything else. And we're not gonna be able to reach far beyond our state boundaries, if, if that. Um, so it seems to me like federal action is also going to be uh, very important in terms of developing this. So one question would be what's happening on the federal level uh, along these lines? A second area is private versus government. I mean, we're, we're talking, we, we have oversight over the IT systems of the state, but um, we don't have any oversight over what goes on privately uh, in terms of enacting standards or telling companies what they can and can't do. Uh, well, we might have some, but it's kind of limited and uh, has to address the public good. Um, a lot of these questions are so deep that I wonder whether, a, in the third area, whether they might be more addressed by academia than a commission. And then the fourth is distinction between operational artificial intelligence and judgmental artificial intelligence. Well, by that, it sort of goes to what Dr. Cohen was talking about, which, uh, which is, you know, we want AI to make a decision in if we're driving and the uh, car has to break because of an obstacle, but we also want human involvement in uh, decisions that affect people's lives. So the example that Lucy brought up, Representative Rogers brought up about um, a computer making a decision whether somebody gets into medical school or not. So these are all very complex and uh, I think we're, we're, we're taking a little bite out of a huge apple. <laughs> and uh, I'll you know, Thanks, Mike. comment on that or not. Okay. Uh, Representative China. Yeah, I'd actually like to comment. I, I know I'm, I, my time is up, but I'm still kind of here as a witness. I'd like to comment on that. And then I have sort of a question that I'm hoping the other guests could speak to, um, to help elaborate um, something. So just to speaking to what Representative Yantajka was asking about, like the debate um, and the discussion being left to academia more than a commission, that's something that I've heard through our testimony, you know, that this does happen in academia. This does happen within the field. One of the issues is that it, the public in general is not being engaged enough. And that the difference between the academic work and the government work is that the government is directly accountable to all people. And so by creating a commission and empowering that commission with that work, then we are increasing the, the possibility for the public to be involved in shaping the policy. And it, it, it's, incre it's democratizing it more and, um, and spreading power beyond academia and business where it's been concentrated out to the people. And so that's why I would argue that the commission um, is necessary. I see John Cohn's hand, so I'll let you speak to that. And then I'll ask, then I'd like to, if it's okay, Representative Sibilia, I'd like to ask a question for our other guests to speak to because it's something I would like to talk about, but I don't have the expertise, so. So, uh, so I want to make sure uh, that we also give um, uh, both of our guests a moment to comment on the bill. I know uh, they have been commenting uh, kind of along the way, but if there are any additional comments. So I guess at this point, uh, responding to Representative China and then commenting would be... Okay, just very quickly, the uh, Representative Yantachka and, and Representative China, the, 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 this idea of, of how universities might fit in, Again, I, I, I feel that kind of having a foot in both, uh, uh, there may be some gray areas, but I think it's a pretty bright line. I think that I loved the idea early on, we, we talked about doing research around how we could use AI to look for uh, bias and, and uh, you know, unintended consequences. That, that's an academic uh, uh, topic. But I, I believe that where public safety and public good is, is necessary that, um, as a career academic, I would say you don't want to leave that to universities. I think that you know there are things that uh, you know that like for example the autonomous driving cars that if you know or or other other forms of automation that are going to be 
uh, affecting the, the uh, inhabitants of the state of the Vermont. Where a public safety is a, an area, then that's clearly a place where I think an admin, you know, or a public good. That's why I like H263's idea of having some targeted, you know, understanding of what technology is being used in the state and, and by the state, and and having guidelines on those that you know are deemed to have a public a good aspect. So I think that there's a pretty bright line things that we might explore with academia, and I really encourage. I love the idea of having a partnership between the state and and the higher learning institutes, you know, uh, including Dartmouth. UVM, Middlebury, all, all of those. But I do think that the H263, leaving that only to universities that don't have a point of enforcement, I think uh, uh, does, doesn't, you know, doesn't uh, serve the public that well, if, that, if I understood the, the, the idea. Yeah. I, think, yeah. I think that uh, having the universities, drawing the universities in is not only good because it allows us to explore some things, but in, in the same way of creating jobs, it's a great way of actually building the strength of our local universities on the topic. I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, speaking just for UVM, UVM is already distinguishing itself in some areas like in complex systems, you know, emergent behavior. And I think that this might be, a you know, an AI ethics area might be a great place for the state of Vermont to start to distinguish itself. Yeah, I, I'd like to add to that too and amplify is that you know, academia is very good at exploring questions, exploring theories, exploring, you know, ultimately, I mean, I'm in academia because I want to explore way out concepts and, and things that may be really crazy, but it's not enough because uh, for lack of a better term, once the, you know, once the rubber hits the road, you know, it's gone out into the public. It's something that's going to be used. It's something that's going to affect, you know, uh, lives. That's where, you know, the, the aspect of the government, the aspect of, you know, as Representative Tina said, you know, this is affecting people directly. That's a different point of view. I, I should say not different point of view, but it's a, it's, a, it's a broader point of view than say academia is actually considering. So it's a partnership that, you know, we need to draw all those together. And so, you know, one aspect, you know, I, I very much also support both bills and what, addressing the second bill on, you know, what system is there, that's, that's a natural part of that. But going back to the commission itself, the commission, uh, one aspect of it that excites me is that it serves as a bridge between the theoretical exploration. And, and actually, let me, let me bring up this. Today, one of the drivers of the exponential growth of AI, it's so easy to deploy AI. I don't know how many undergraduates I've had come to me from freshmen, even high school students, that are building AI and putting them out. Now the question is that, are they aware of what they're doing? Are they aware of, or is the public aware of what they're doing? Are people aware of what their impacts are going to be? And so, you know, the commission serves as, you know, this mechanism to enhance that awareness further. Um, so, yeah, that's what I wanted to add on that. All right. Excellent. Uh, is there anything else uh, that you would like to tell us about these bills today or any other questions from, uh, from the committee or Mr. Chair, uh, is there any, any questions? Tabilia, I, I, I wanted to know if our guests, because while you have them here, it's a really important opportunity that in H263, it talks about independent testing for bias of automated decision systems. And um, I think it might be, if, if our guests are willing to just speak a little bit about that, like how do you do that? Because if we're asking if it's done and we're talking about giving the power to the Agency of Digital Services to have some standards around that, it might be good for them to just speak a little bit about how that's done. I see some hands, so it looks like they have some thoughts. So, uh, uh, I, I have a hard stop here in a couple of minutes, so I, I'm glad you asked that, uh, Representative Gina. Um, I, I think that the bias, uh, you know, is is something that it depends on what the bias might be because of the application. But there are uh, great open source and and closed source efforts that that try to look at bias in terms of uh, representative. You know, uh, Representative Sims talk, or I believe, or no, maybe it's Representative Rogers. One, uh, we're talking about bias in terms of, you know, uh, rec recognizing you know gender bias, et cetera. Um, my company, IBM, has has put in the 
uh, in the public uh, something called an AI Fairness 360 tools. So they're, they're tools that are open for testing for bias. They're basically curated data sets that would allow you to check bias in certain con con uh, certain scenarios. I think, uh, I, I believe that there are technical solutions to this. Um, they are gonna be application specific. You know, they're going to be in terms of, you know, like gender bias or racial bias. Um, but I believe that there are, there are tools out there that would allow you to test specific uh, decision-making based on uh, demographics. And I think that we, uh, once we have the survey that is uh, recommended in H263, I think we could go and figure out whether there are bias sets or not for some of these, um, for all of the, the applications, and then, and then figure out how to apply them. I, I suspect that there would be areas where there are, is no such test case, and maybe that's a place where we would work with academia. Gene, yeah, let me let me yeah, let me add on top of that. Yeah. yeah, there's many efforts going out there. You'll hear terms if you if you want to go search out, like just simply explainable AI, explanatory or XAI, which is you know one of the acronyms they use. the The one thing though that I, I, I to, to um, amplify what John was saying is that. You know, it's very application specific, but it depends on the question you're asking. All right, what's the bias you should be looking for? Uh, I think something even more troublesome though, is that really uh, bias, I would say is, is a special case of, we don't have enough information, we don't have enough knowledge. And then how do we know that we don't have that information? And that's on the side of academia. Hey, what can we present out? If we're gonna develop this, can we identify this? And that itself is an open question. Um, but again, back down the application, you know, when, when you're talking about the transparency of why that decision came from and what is it driven from? And then if you can, even at a minimum, doing an analysis on the data that you're using to drive that decision, that analysis could be, you know, a gender analysis. It could be, you know, a, a decision bias analysis, a demographic analysis. At least that gives a clearer context that, okay, uh, I'm basing my decision, as this is what we as human beings do, right? I'm drawing my decision based on the evidence I have, but now I have to self-assess, uh, what is the nature of this evidence? Great, okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate uh, all of the time that you spent here with us today. Um, this is a, a, a interesting topic and I, I think we'll be taking uh, more time up on it. Mr. Chair, anything else that you'd like to add? Just, uh, just my apologies to, to Jean and John. I, I uh, had some technological challenges and actually sprinted. I'm probably a quarter mile from Jean's office right now. Um, I'm, I had to come to my office. So um, I'll be interested to watch the first 40 minutes of this discussion uh, on YouTube tonight, um, but apologize, but that it's been fascinating what I've heard and um, appreciate both of your direction and also um, Representative China for um, his leadership on this. And we are definitely gonna dig uh, deeper into this in coming weeks. So I wanna thank everybody. Thank you all. And thanks for taking this up. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And good to see you, John. <laughs> for, uh, for committee members, um, let's take a five minute break um, since we've had uh, two hours uh, straight here. Um, and let's come back at, um, what time? 11.07. And um, we're going to have some discussion about H360, um, as I uh, um, forewarned yesterday.